I'm running out of intros. So I set my course, my battle begins. There's no mistake in this feeling. I feel no remorse, no, I can't resist. I'm breaking away. I don't know. I, just, I can't think of one. Whatever. You're here for the review. So, I figured since I still have some time left and Lord knows I have just been throwing reviews out like they're Skittles just everywhere. Just just take them. Just have some more. You want some more? Is that what you want? That's what you're going to get. So, since RE8 is less than a week away now, I figured we'd take a brief moment to discuss uh, two more games that I haven't brought up yet that are kind of, sort of, not in the main series, but are, this is, I might as well. And before I get actually eaten by somebody, because Lord knows one of you is going to do that, I am acutely aware that Resident Evil is a very large series with a bunch of different spin-off titles in it. There are of course the Umbrella Chronicles and Dark Side Chronicles games that are excellent games for the Wii. They are rail shooters, and basically retellings of a lot of the main series games that I've already talked about up until now. There are, of course, a bunch of bad Resident Evil games, such as Survivor, which is a disaster in every conceivable way. But I don't really want to ruin this, you know, little retrospective by pointing out all the bad things the series has done, because for the most part, the Resident Evil series is an excellent series that any horror fan would be happy to enjoy. So let's stop beating around the bush and discuss these last two games that have basically nothing in common except for the fact they both star Claire Redfield, who is a fan favorite. To begin with, Resident Evil Code Veronica. This is a really interesting one because apparently it was created specifically to get out of a contract that Capcom had with Sony at the time. Basically said that they had to publish any main series Resident Evil game on the Sony platforms. Hence why Code Veronica is not actually a numbered Resident Evil game. Because, for all intents and purposes, it is Resident Evil 4. Whereas Resident Evil 4 should be Resident Evil 5, and so on and so forth. Code Veronica actually has more to do with the series when it comes to the overall story of Umbrella and the main plot that was going on at this point than 4 could ever hope to. There are a ton of things that were revealed in Code Veronica, such as the survival of Albert Wesker, who was the main villain from the original games, as well as expanding on Umbrella's fiddling with the T-Virus, in this case it'll be the T-Veronica virus, and seemingly a much better continuation of the events past Raccoon City. Again, there's more to do from a plot perspective here with the overall story of the series at the time when compared to what 4 gave us. I also think it's hilarious that Code Veronica is set up in this way, in, you know, trying to avoid this Sony contract, because, like, 4 wound up being ported to every single console imaginable, and even Code Veronica wouldn't stay Dreamcast exclusive forever, it would eventually be ported to PS2 as well as GameCube for that matter. But what's a bit hard to get a hold of nowadays, as far as I know, it's never been released, like, on Steam or anything like that, and it's a shame, too, because it's a great game that I absolutely think should be given the remake treatment that 2 and 3 got, because I think it's definitely worth it in that regard. Again, it has more to do with the series, so why not? A lot of people have haven't been able to experience this one, at least not fully. Also, I should probably mention there are two different versions of Code Veronica. There's Code Veronica, the regular one. There's also Resident Evil Code Veronica X. Presumably, it stars Mega Man X as the main character. That's a joke. Basically like a special edition version of Code Veronica with new cutscenes and different plot elements added and bonuses and stuff like that. So effectively, if you can get any of the versions, obviously go for X, but if you can't, it's not enough to warrant like seeking it out specifically to replay the whole game if you already own Code Veronica, but it's just something else to note where there's one version that is going to be outright superior purely because there's more content. There you go. This game stars Claire and her brother Chris, actually. Dealing with an umbrella installation in Antarctica, Claire gets captured because she's out of her mind. No, seriously, Claire is insane. She has been soloing umbrella facilities all over the world to try to find her brother and get dirt on them. And can we talk about the fact that Claire, out of the entire original Resident Evil cast, is the least experienced combatant? Claire is the only one without any real military training. She's not a police officer, she's not a STARS operative, she's not anything like that. Claire was the only one who was just a normal person, and she's the one running around like a crazy person dodging helicopters and taking on SWAT teams. Like, this isn't normal. I mean, that is the sexiest thing I've ever seen, Claire. Also, 
What is the matter with you? You need to relax. I know that this is a big deal because bioweapons are horrible and you want to stop Raccoon City from happening to anybody else and find your lost brother, but also, um, you know, there are, are like therapy groups for this. There's, there's, there's a level of reasonability that I don't think you're applying to yourself, and it's just worrying. Anyway, as far as the game goes, it's pretty typical Resident Evil, at least at this time. The tank controls are perfectly intact, and since there's been no update, naturally you're kind of stuck with them. Though, I gotta admit, I felt like the tank controls in Code Veronica were actually a lot better compared to other Resident Evil games. I think it's because the camera is less willing to take weird angles, and it doesn't dart around nearly as often. So once you get used to it, I think it's a pretty decent game to control, despite having those tank mechanics. Now this game is quintessential survival horror, so there's gonna be a ton of inventory management, and you have limited saves, and you have to worry about how much damage you're taking, because health items actually are pretty sparse. That's actually the one thing I really noticed about Code Veronica. I really felt like herbs and healing items in general were a lot harder to find. Maybe it was just me, or maybe I was just having bad luck with getting hit, but it doesn't help that the tank controls definitely make combat a lot tougher. And the enemies in this game are pretty tough and difficult to deal with. There's plenty of times where running is an option, but it's a lot harder to do that because you have narrow ways to go. It just makes the game a bit more of a challenge in general. The puzzles are here, and, and in typical Resident Evil fashion, they are cryptic as hell. But I felt them a lot easier to figure out kind of what to do in most situations. It might just be me though, because I've been playing Resident Evil so long that I'm kind of used to just the way it is, so usually I can tell when it's like, okay, I obviously can't take this item right now, so I'll have to leave and come back, etc, etc, etc. Oh, can we discuss how great looking this game was for the time? Like, this is one of the best looking Dreamcast games available, if I'm being honest. It looks gorgeous. I know graphics don't make a game, but hey, it's just something else to note. Code Veronica is a much beloved game among Resident Evil fans in general, and if you haven't played it, I definitely think it's worth it, especially if you care about the old games and the original storyline and stuff like that. There's so much here that you really need to see. And if you're looking for something new in old school Resident Evil and haven't had the chance to try this out, definitely seek out a copy if you can, although admittedly getting a hold of this game now can be a little expensive because, again, it's one of those games that hasn't really seen a lot of re-releases or, you know, any kind of availability given to it. Which is a shame, because I definitely think it definitely deserves, at the very least, a remake or a re-release on some kind of digital platform. Something. Because there's so much here to appreciate from a Resident Evil perspective. And now on to the other game we're going to discuss today, Resident Evil Revelations 2. I discussed Revelations 1 in a video a long, long, long time ago. Revelations 1 was, of course, a 3DS game that was later ported to other platforms, like the Wii U, for example, and it was an excellent game on those platforms. However, this time around is Revelations 2. Does it have much to do with Revelations 1? Well, not really, if I'm being honest. It's weird. This is one of the only series I've seen so far that has completely gone in a different direction between sequels. I mean, that happens sometimes in the main series, but it usually waits a little bit to do that. But Revelations 2, like, mentions something of Revelations 1, but the overall events of 2 have almost nothing to do with 1. If anything, Revelations 2 has more to do with the main series than Revelations 1 does. And that's only because of the main villain and the main virus you're dealing with here. It's another strain of the T-Virus called the T-Phobos virus. This version of the T-Virus responds to fear, which is interesting. It also has Ouroboros in it from Resident Evil 5, and the main villain is Alex Wesker. No, not Albert Wesker, Alex Wesker, who is his... Well, <laughs> technically, they're not related but they were both part of the same eugenics project, so she is considered to be his sister. They're both Weskers. Without going into too much detail on this, because that's plot spoilers, she is directly responsible for the entire events of this game. Dealing with a different Wesker was an interesting and bold move, and I kind of like the idea that they're expanding on this eugenics project, because it was already revealed in 5 that Albert was the product of some kind of eugenics project done by Umbrella, but he was one of many kids. So it's not unreasonable to suggest that there would be more survivors from the project. Most of them did die, that's in canon, we know this. Albert was one of those survivors, but it's never been quite revealed how many died. 
Alex apparently didn't. The way that the narrative is told in this game is actually very unique. You play as two different pairs of people. On one side of the game, you play as Claire and Mora Birkin. Mora, by the way, is the daughter of Barry Birkin, who you may remember as one of the characters from the original game. Also, his and her presence implies that it was Jill's playthrough in the first game that must be canon, because Barry knows all about Wesker and all that, therefore those events had to have happened, where if you play through Chris, that doesn't happen. So Chris is the one that got captured in the first game, and that's canon, therefore Jill was the one who went around the entire mansion in the first game. That's what we're going with. Don't actually mean in the comments, because I have already determined that I am right, and you are wrong, and that's how the internet works. Right? Anyway, on the flip side, you play as Barry Birkin, like I just mentioned, as well as a little girl named Natalia. And I've already lost you because it's like, wait, the second player is a little girl? Well, how can she shoot? Well, that's part of the deal. See, I completely forgot about this when I was talking about Resident Evil Zero, but Revelations 2 actually operates in a similar way compared to the way Zero did, where you were one person controlling two people. Now, to be fair, you can play it in co-op, but because of the people's drastically different gameplay styles, it means that one player is going to be kind of limited. Effectively, Claire Redfield and Barry are offense. They will always have the guns, they have all the guns, they have all the ammo, they shoot the stuff, that's what they do. Moira hates guns. She refuses to use them unless you do something specific. In which case, she will do it in her own story, but not in the main story. She never does that. She doesn't like firearms. So she uses a crowbar and uses a flashlight to help Claire out. So she's more of a support character. Same thing goes for Natalia. Natalia is, has some weird connection with the monsters on the island. She can see them behind walls, and she can go in narrow places where Barry can't get to and activate switches if necessary. The players, or the single player, has to use both both characters to solve certain puzzles, much like Resident Evil Zero. You have to use teamwork in this game to get through. It's really cool in that way, and the game retains a lot of the horror aspects that Revelations was so good at. This game doesn't skimp in terms of body horror or really weird freak out moments. It's still got plenty of terror for you, but I do find that there's more of an action focus in Revelations 2 compared to the first one. The game was also pretty good looking for the time, so no complaints there, and the voice acting's top notch. But there's another thing about the game that bothers me, um, and that's its episodics. The game was released in episodes. There were four main episodes as well as two side episodes you could get. Naturally, you have to pay separately for each of the episodes or just buy them all in bulk as a single game. But they weren't released all at the same time. Now, releasing a game in episodes can be actually kind of cool because that means that if you aren't sure about a game, you don't necessarily have to pay full price for the whole thing. You can buy, you know, just the first part. Actually, I'm pretty sure when Revelations 2 first came out, the first part was free initially. Although it doesn't seem to be that way on Steam now, so whatever. In any event, the point is, you didn't have to spend all your money on this game that you weren't sure about, therefore giving a lot of people more options to, you know, see how much they liked the game before spending the rest of their hard-earned money on the rest of the game wholly. But at the same time, it just means the whole thing is split up weirdly, and it doesn't flow as well as I think it should. But to be fair, the narrative is also split up, because both sides of the story here aren't actually happening at the same time. Each of these stories are actually six months apart. They are directly tied together, but you won't get the full picture until you're almost at the end of the game. I also think it can be redundant to go through the same effective stages, just using two different, you know, characters on, you know, separated by six months. I mean, it does change things up a bit because, you know, naturally things change in six months, and it's kind of cool how they did that. But I'm also still trekking through the same basic map. I see what you did there. That was a cost-saving measure. I don't buy that for a second. I know exactly why you did that. But, you know, it's done in a creative way, so I can't really come down too hard on it. But it is something, like, to note. Also, can we give it to Barry for, like, going gung-ho and still working for the BSAA at this point? This man is pushing 60 years old by this time. And he's still, like, suiting up with a machine gun and going off and fighting unspeakable horrors. Like, this is something that no person should ever be considering doing. Like, dude, it is time to retire. It's okay, man. There's also some controversy surrounding this game, believe it or not, and I'm only bringing this up because of how stupid I think it is. And it's imperative I talk about this. All right, so years ago I read an article, I won't mention the website, but let me just say the website has taken like a sleep downgrade in terms of the quality of its content in general. Um, but the website wrote an article complaining about this game because of how you have to get the good ending. And I'm just gonna tell you because it is a little hard to figure out when it first happens. It's not abundantly clear what you're supposed to do. I mentioned that Moira, 
doesn't like using guns. She won't even touch them. And that has to do with some trauma that happened in her past. See, what happened was Barry left his guns unlocked. Moira got into the guns, she was a child, and accidentally shot her little sister. The little sister survived, but that's what part of, sort of divided them as father and daughter, because Barry made Moira feel like it was her fault, when in reality, Barry was supposed to be the responsible gun owner and keep his firearms out of reach of irresponsible children. In order to get the good ending of the game, Moira has to face her crippling phobia of firearms, and by that I mean she has to use a gun at one point to save Claire. You have to actually force Moira to grab the gun, not Claire. You can do either one, but one will result in the bad ending. Now, the article I read was complaining about this because the notion that a person should be forced to use a gun is like against all, you know, gun control advocate, you know, ambition. Like, guns are bad, and you should never make that seem like using a gun should be a good thing. But I think what's important here is the context of the situation. To begin with, the only reason Moira has to do this is because it's about facing her fear. Like I said, the T-Phobos virus is activated because of fear. That's the only reason it happens at all. Like, you won't mutate if you never feel any fear. So by facing her fear and not being scared anymore, it's helping her survive the virus. That's A. B. The context of the situation doesn't really call for I've made a joke about this whole political thing in the Resident Evil universe in one of my shorts, but really, your hippie nonsense has no place here. There are unspeakable abominations, viral infected mutants that are trying to maul you. Now is not the time to get on your high horse and be like, I don't use guns, guns are bad. Look, dude. In a normal world, where all you're doing is going to Walmart, yeah, you know what, I get it. The dude open carrying at the Walmart probably has some insecurity issues. That I'll agree with. But in a zombie apocalypse situation, or a survival situation, now is not the time for that. Now is the time to use whatever means necessary to survive. And that was the whole point of this scene. It wasn't making some kind of statement that guns are magically good. It was making a statement that, hey, um, you need to live. And sometimes you have to get over your fears and anxieties in order to do that. That was the message. And I think from a gun control perspective, it actually comes from a really good place because of Barry's whole feeling bad about his irresponsibility. At the end of the day, it was his fault that one of his daughters shot the other one. It wasn't the kid's fault because they didn't know what they were dealing with. He failed to educate his daughters. He failed to lock up his firearms. He failed to be a responsible gun owner. The game makes no attempt to hide this fact, it's actually a vocal point of the plot. So if anything, I think the game does more for gun control activists than against them, but the whole point is that you kind of have to bridge this gap where, um, sometimes you need to shoot a thing unless you feel like dying today. Bad people exist. It's a fact. It's trying to play middle of the road and doing an exceptional job of it. But naturally, the article I read went completely, you know, out into left, far, far left field. And, and was just like, this game is promoting gun violence. It's but because I cherry picked this one scene and completely ignored the rest of the narrative and ignored the fact that we're killing zombies and that this is kind of a unique circumstance. and. Really, anything to, 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 that, that would make that article seem stupid was ignored in the article itself, and I hated it. I don't know why I brought it up, but apparently, like, this was a major thing that was discussed, and apparently it bothered people, but, like, I don't think you're interpreting it correctly. I don't think you're appreciating the brilliance of this narrative, and I don't think that that article was very good. I just had to complain about it. Anyway, back to the game. The game is a lot of fun. And, you know, the fact that it has multiplayer makes it even better. I don't think it's as good as the first Revelations. It can be kind of boring, I felt. I felt like sometimes it was the narrative was slow in some parts. But it got good towards the end. It had its moments. And I think it is an enjoyable game for Resident Evil fans to pick up and play if you haven't. So definitely give it a shot if you have not done that yet. Both these games. See, this is what I'm talking about. Resident Evil is so good. And I hope RE8 is going to be just as good. Because the only really bad game I've talked about so far is six. And you know, like when you have a series of games and only one of those is bad, I mean how many series can really say that? Capcom's pretty good at making games. Talk about a lot of Capcom games too. 
I mean, first we did the Mega Man thing, and now all of a sudden people are like, Resident Evil! And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm doing this now. <sighs> Whatever. Anyway, only got a few late. Only got a few days up to RE8, so, uh, so. <sighs> I'm not feeling well today. Mm. I need to take a walk. Uh, it'll be. I'll, uh, till next time. This is me, Darkness. I'll bid you all fun, farewell, whatever. You, the, you, you know, you know, you know it. You know it already. Just whatever.